I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. Last episode on Myth Madness, I talked about the Hittite god Telepinu, and the myth telling how one day he went missing, and other gods were forced to mount a search and get him to return. The disappearance of Telepinu was a very critical event. With Telepinu gone, the land became sterile. The gods themselves first knew something was wrong when they held a big feast, but remained hungry and thirsty. The themes of this story are also echoed in the real world, where the Hittites put a huge emphasis on making sure their gods and goddesses were always present and listening to them. I talked about how losing gods' attention, like Telepinu's, was very dangerous, because the geography of the Hittites' kingdom was difficult, and they felt that they needed the gods' help to survive at all. So, to appease the gods, festivals would be held, and the Hittites would reenact their myths, like the story of Telepino's disappearance, alongside rituals to appease angry gods. But within the story, there was a key detail that I want to go back to right now. In the myth, the goddess Hannah Hannah sent a bee to find Telepino. The bee was successful and found the god sleeping. To get him to wake up, the bee stung him. But this only made Telepino angrier, and he then lashes out, with thunder and lightning. This is important. Up to now, Telepino is treated like a fertility god. When he leaves, the land suffers. But now, he is using thunder and lightning. The reason being, instead of just being a fertility god, he is also a storm god. And in fact, this actually makes sense. As a storm god, he would be responsible for rain, and so responsible for keeping crops and other plants with enough fresh water. But Telepino is described as the son of the storm god. The Hittites had multiple storm gods, and some of them seem to have been grouped together into a kind of family. A very loose family, though, since the relationships between different Hittite gods and goddesses is rarely crystal clear. In the first Hittite episode, episode 23 of the pod, I gave a quick breakdown of some of the gods and goddesses in the Hittite religion, and also from some of the surrounding cultures that were influential. One of those gods, in particular, is usually just referred to in writing as the Storm God, but the Hittites also called him the Weather God of Heaven and the Lord of the Land of Hatti. The actual spoken names used for this god were Tarhuna, which means conquering or conqueror. The name Zaskapuna also appears in Hittite records. This Tarhuna, or Zaskapuna, this Lord of the Land of Hatti, was one of the most important Hittite gods. He was seen as the preserver of all order in the universe, and the Hittite king himself was just his deputy. Tarhuna was a weather god, with power over thunder and lightning, when in a good mood, he brought rain, making him important for farmers' fields and good harvests. He lived on mountaintops, and when traveling, made his way in a chariot pulled by bulls. In art, he had a beard and wore a tall pointed hat which was also a symbol used to mark many gods and goddesses in Hittite art generally. Alongside his three-pointed lightning bolt, Tarhuna wielded an axe. He is very, very similar to the pre-Hittite god Taru and the Luwian god Tarhuns I mentioned in the first Hittite episode. Tarhuna is likely an offshoot of these gods, especially the Luwian Tarhuns, and comes from an older storm god from the time before the Neshite Hittites entered Anatolia. The Hittites themselves recognized, at least to a degree, their storm god Tarhuna's similarities with some other storm gods from other nearby cultures. Two examples are Teshub, from their Hurian neighbors, and Baal, or Hadad, from nearby Canaan. The best example is Teshub, who was very much brought into the Hittite religion and later made equivalent to the Hittite storm god. But the Hittites always believed their lord of the land of Hatti was special to them, and they, were his special people. The wife of Tarhuna was a sun goddess. Because she was one of many sun gods worshipped by the Hittites, she is often referred to as Erinidi, or the sun goddess of Arena, since Arena was the city that was the center of her cult. Tarhuna and this Arena sun goddess had several children. Two of them were more storm gods, but they were tied to specific cities. One was the storm god of the city Zipalanda, and another son was the storm god of Narek. There were more storm gods too, all believed to live on various mountaintops. Many of them were partnered with the goddesses of freshwater springs, or ones referred to as ladies of the palace. 
These storm gods were not necessarily the sons of Tarhuna. In the old Hittite period, Tarhuna had a companion named Washazili. He was called a lion among the gods, so was considered a heroic figure. He may have been the brother of Tarhuna, or served as his advisor. Washazili likely had power over storms himself, and was possibly called the storm god of the countryside. But let's go back to Telepinu, another son of Tarhuna and the Arena sun goddess. He is described as Tarhuna's favorite and firstborn son. Earlier in this episode, I pointed out how Telepinu has powers over thunder and lightning, showing he is yet another Hittite storm god. I talked a lot about Telepinu last episode, about his disappearance and his return, but there is actually another myth featuring Telepinu that survives, and it tells how he acquired a wife. Let me first set the stage. In Hittite myth, there seems to be an opposition between two sets of gods. One set is our storm god family, some sun-related gods, and maybe some others. They do not always get along with the more earth-related gods that make up another group. One of those gods is the sea god, typically named Aruna. In this story, we have the sea god, and he is responsible for bringing the sun god down from heaven, possibly through trickery, and hiding him away under the sea. With the sun god now absent, we have a similar situation to when Telepinu went missing. On land, the conditions become very bad, and everything grows dark. No one can withstand the power of the sea. How to solve this problem? Thankfully, Telepinu is going to come and save us. Tarhuna, the storm god, summoned his favorite and firstborn son, and he told Telepinu to go to the sea and bring back the sun god. So Telepinu went to the sea. He must have made quite the impression, but we're not told what happened exactly. The text says that the sea god became afraid of him and decided to give Telepinu his own daughter, named Hatapuna. Aruna the sea god also returned the sun god to Telepinu, and so our favorite son returned to the storm god with these two people. But later, Aruna sent a messenger, a river spirit, to Tarhuna to complain. Aruna pointed out that Telepinu took his daughter, and so the sea god demanded he be given a bride price for his daughter. Tarhuna went and asked the goddess Hanahana what he should do. Hanahana is the Hittite mother goddess, and she seems to be responsible for solving a few of the storm god Tarhuna's problems. Hanahana points out to Tarhuna that, well, Telepinu did take Hatapuna, the sea god's daughter, and since that's a fact, the sea god is owed a bride price and so Tarhuna should give it to him. So Tarhuna ended up sending the sea god a thousand cows and a thousand sheep. We don't know the rest of the story, but Aruna the sea god did accept the livestock, so he was presumably happy with this arrangement. The sea god got his bride price. The sun god was back in the sky, and the land returned to normal. Telepinu now had a wife, Hatapuna herself, who is mostly moved around in this story like a piece of property. Similar to what I said in my earlier episode on the Greek goddess Persephone, this story reflects the Hittite society's attitudes towards young women still living in the homes of their fathers. It also might refer to the kinds of monetary consequences required by young men taking part in bridal kidnappings. In fact, this is not the last Hittite myth to give some clues on the different types of marriage in Hittite society. Let's go back to talking about the main storm god of Hittite myth. I already mentioned how he was the guarantor of order in the universe. A major element of his cult was his triumph over a serpent monster named Iluyanka. This name directly translates to serpent. There are two versions of this battle between Tarhuna and Iluyanka. Both are incomplete, but we can still understand the stories. The surviving copies date somewhere within 1500 to 1190 BC, during the time of the Hittite Empire but the presence of more archaic Hittite words is evidence to archaeologists that the narratives go back to at least 1750 BC, and possibly much older than that, too. That's more than a thousand years older than our Greek poets Homer and Hesiod. In the first version, there are no specific character names or geographic names given for a setting. Since I've been calling him Tarhuna, this is what I will call the storm god in this myth but you should know most translations I've found for this story just refer to him as Storm God. The story starts very quickly. A first battle is not described, but we know it occurs in the sea. We are told that Iluyanka, 
the serpent, defeated the storm god Tarhuna. After his victory, Iluyanka takes Tarhuna's heart and eyes and hides them. What does this mean? It means that Tarhuna is now disabled, and he has lost his divine power. Naturally, the storm god now fears Iluyanka. He is in no shape to take on the serpent again. What follows is Tarhuna carrying out a long, convoluted plan to get his strength back. Tarhuna goes away and finds the daughter of a poor man. He takes this woman as his wife, and she soon gives birth to a son. This son of the storm god grew up, and eventually found his own fiancé, and she was none other than the daughter of Iluyanka. How did this happen? We don't know. Maybe you can imagine some kind of forbidden love, a Romeo and Juliet scenario. Maybe it was luck. Maybe there was an arrangement involved. Nevertheless, Tarhuna repeatedly gives his son these instructions, that when he leaves to go live in the house of his new wife, the daughter of Iluyanka, the son is to demand as his bride price the heart and eyes of the storm god, and nothing else. So the son of the storm god does just that. He goes to live with his new wife's family, and he goes to the serpent Iluyanka. He demands the heart, and they give it to him. He demands the eyes, and they gave that to him too. With the heart and eyes now secured, the son of the storm god goes back to his father. Tarhuna took them back and became whole. He regained his strength and power. He was more than ready to return to the sea and finish what he started with Iluyanka so long ago. Tarhuna went to the sea and began a fierce battle with Iluyanka. With his strength back, it was only a matter of time before the storm god gained the upper hand. But then we get to the tragedy of this myth. Because Tarhuna's son was married to Iluyanka's daughter, the son of the storm god's allegiance, for the sake of honor, was now with his new wife's family. For that reason, the son of the storm god found himself on the side of Iluyanka, fighting against his father. In the middle of the battle, the son calls out to his father, telling him to have no pity on him, and to include him with the storm god's enemies. So, in defeating them, Tarhuna kills his old enemy Iluyanka, but he also kills his son, the person who was so crucial to returning Tarhuna to power. So what is going on in this version? What is up with the son of the storm god's shift in allegiance? This myth is actually referring to rules that governed a special kind of marriage in Hittite society. Remember at the beginning it was said that the storm god went and married the daughter of a poor man? This was actually an important detail. A powerless god marrying the daughter of a poor man means the son of that storm god will grow up in poverty. As you heard in the earlier myth about how Telepino got a wife, potential husbands were supposed to give a bride price to a father-in-law to marry their daughter. But according to Hittite law, if a young suitor was too poor to pay a bride price for a wife, he could offer himself as a live-in husband. The engaged man would live and work in the household of his wealthier father-in-law, and in exchange he would get a wife, but he would also get something else, a reverse bride price, paid to him by the father-in-law. This is what happened in this Iluyanka story. A poor son of the storm god married the daughter of Iluyanka with this arrangement. He goes to live with the father-in-law's family, and he asks for the heart and eyes as the bride price from his new father-in-law, Iluyanka. The son of the storm god is now in a case of divided loyalty. He is the son of the storm god, so you would think he will side with his father. But he is also the live-in son-in-law of the serpent, and for that reason his loyalty goes to Iluyanka, whose household he is now a part of. In the end, his choice costs him his life. In this version, trickery and the help of a mortal are necessary for Tarhuna to triumph over Iluyanka. The second Iluyanka myth is actually quite different from the first story. The second version also provides lots of names and also specific locations for the story's events. But trickery and the help of a mortal are going to remain the most important parts. In this second version, the serpent Iluyanka is a land creature. We are not told he lives in the sea. Instead, at the beginning, he emerges from a hole in the ground, a cave. Iluyanka and the storm god Tarhuna fight at a place called Kiskalusa. Like in the other version, Iluyanka defeated the storm god, 
we are not told the specifics of how Tarhuna is disabled. Now weakened after his defeat, but armed with a plan, Tarhuna invites all of the gods to a great feast. He gets his daughter, Inara, the goddess of wild animals and the wilderness, to prepare the feast. She gets everything ready, and there is lots of it. Large storage vessels filled with wine, beer, and other drinks. In the text, we get Hittite words for drinks. Marnuwan, some kind of beer, and Walhi, an unknown drink. There is plenty of food, too. This is supposed to be a magnificent feast, worthy of all the gods. With the food and drink prepped done, Inara then travels to the town of Ziggurata, and there she found a mortal, a human man named Hupasia. Inara approaches Hupasia, and presumably tells him her plan to help the storm god. The tablet itself literally quotes her as only saying, I am about to do such and such a thing. Join me. But Hupasia proposes an exchange. He replies that if Inara allows him to sleep with her, he will do whatever her heart's desires. She sleeps with him, sealing the arrangement, and then she leads him to the feast and hides Hupasia where no one can see. When it's time for the feast, Inara took some time to dress herself up and went to the cave of Iluyanka. She calls down into his hole, telling Iluyanka that she is preparing a feast. Everyone is invited, and he should come eat and drink. Iluyanka the serpent came, and he also brought all his serpent children, too. So imagine a long table with lots of serpent snake monsters sitting at it, and all the other gods as well, all nervously staring at each other over their drinks. They begin to eat and drink all the delicious things that Inara has prepared. They drink all the wine, beer, and other beverages, and soon become very, very drunk. Iluyanka and the other serpents also do not want to go back to their cave. They want to drink some more. But Inara's trap was ready to be sprung. Hupasia came out of hiding and tied up the drunk Iluyanka with rope. And with the serpent immobilized, the storm god finally appeared. The gods joined him in killing Iluyanka and probably all of his serpent children too. So, there you have it. With trickery and the help of a mortal, plus his own daughter Inara, a previously defeated Tarhuna is able to defeat Iluyanka. But what happened to Hupasia? For all his help, he ended up not getting a particularly happy ending. After the feast and Iluyanka's defeat, Inara built herself a house on a rock outcrop high up in the mountains. This castle or house had a great view overlooking the town of Taruka. She moved Hupasia, her new lover, into this house. But Inara can't stay there for long. She's the goddess of the wilderness, after all. So before she leaves, Inara gave Hupasia very specific instructions, that when she left to travel the countryside, Hupasia was not, under any circumstances, to look out the window. And with that, she left to wander through the wild places. After 20 days, Hupasia couldn't resist. He looked out the window and he saw his wife, his children, and the life he had left behind. By the time Inara returned, Hupasia was weeping, and he begged her to let him go back home. It is not clear if Inara let Hupasia return home, or if she killed him, or punished him for breaking her instructions. Unfortunately, it is at this point that the broken tablet becomes completely unreadable. However, in order to give you an ending to this part of the myth featuring Inara and Hupasia, I thought it would be fun to now share a myth from a different culture that follows a similar plot. The other myth I want to share is a Celtic one, specifically from Ireland and certainly not as old as the Hittite one. The mortal man in this story is named Oshin. He is a hero, and out of all of his Irish hero friends, Oshin runs the fastest, jumps the highest, and writes the best poetry. One day, Oshin is hunting a male deer in the forest with his father and another man. They are approached by a woman on a white horse. She is named Neve and is from Tirnanog, the land of youth. Neve addresses Oshin's father. She says that she wants something from him, and Oshin's father replies that he will give her if he possesses it and get it for her if he does not. So basically, he says he will grant her her heart's desires. Sure enough, it is exactly her heart's desire that she has come to ask about. She says she loves Oshin and wants him to come with her to Tirnanok. Oshin agrees, climbs up behind her on the horse, and she rides off with him over a body of water of some kind. 
either a large river or ocean. Neve and Oshin are married, and they live in Tirnanog, a paradise location, and stay in a castle or a palace with a great view. Time passes, and Oshin gazes out the window but cannot see the water he traveled over to get there. Eventually, Oshin also grows bored and restless. Trying to make him happy, Neve allows him to return home one last time, but she gives him very clear instructions. He is to ride back on a horse, but remain sitting on the horse. He is not, under any circumstances, allowed to touch the ground. Oshin rides out of Tirnanog on the horse. He finds that even though only a few years have passed in Tirnanog, 300 years have passed in the real world. Everything is different. The land has changed, the people have changed, his family is long gone. In shock, he falls off his horse and hits the ground. Upon contact with the ground, he ages the 300 years he missed when he was staying in Tirnanog but he is able to pass on his stories to a nearby priest before dying. At their cores, the two stories do have similarities. In the Hittite myth, a mortal man becomes the lover of a goddess. They go and live in a lofty castle, remote from the world because it's high up in the mountains. After peering out of a forbidden window at the earth below, the mortal man grows homesick and begins to pine for the family he left behind. We don't know the end result after the goddess finds the mortal upset, but it's possible he pays with his life. The Irish one presents very much the same situation. Mortal man becomes lover of goddess, and in this case is even married to her. They go and stay in a house or castle remote from the world, in this case in a land that is far away but journeyable. After peering out of a window, the mortal man begins to pine for the family he left behind. In this case, we know the goddess lets him go back, but he also breaks instructions and pays for it with his life. What's also interesting is that when Neve approaches Oshin and his father, the initial dialogue is also very similar in tone to when Inara first greets Hubasia. Both goddesses say they need something without providing specific information, and the mortals say they will do whatever is needed. But why the similarities? Where do they come from? Is it possible these Hittite and Irish stories exist in parallel to each other? That they are versions of the same generic formula? Is it possible that generations of bards and storytellers across Europe were inspired by some earlier storyline featuring a goddess taking a mortal man to a remote location and the mortal missing his family and breaking a taboo because of it? Have our Irish and Hittite stories trickled down through the ages from that same common origin? Maybe. Maybe not. It's hard to say with just these two myths taken in isolation. The Irish myth also includes a handful of specific and interesting innovations. Take the twist about time passing slower in Tir Nanog. There is certainly no evidence of something like that in the Hittite myth. And Oshin aging by 300 years when he falls off his horse. This is very specific information probably couldn't randomly be dreamt up in two different locations by different bards, right? Well, this detail may be part of a shared story formula too. In a Germanic myth from Britain, a king returns from a dwarf wedding to find hundreds of years have passed. A companion of his falls from his horse in shock, ages hundreds of years, and turns to dust. Obviously, there are clear cultural links between Celtic Ireland and Germanic Britain, They are close in time and close in geography. The Hittites are thousands of years in the past and thousands of kilometers away. What these parallels could be indicating is the existence of passed down story elements that are mixed together and reimagined, with innovations being added by talented storytellers and then in turn passed down. Or, at the very least, the parallels show similar ways of thinking by people separated in time and space. And that even in itself, is something to wonder at. And that's all for today. If you're enjoying this podcast, please tell your friends. If you know anyone who enjoys mythology, the Hittites, or ancient civilizations in general, I would appreciate it if you can send it their way. As always, thank you for listening.